Whenever anyone asks me what artists are important to me, Richard is the first person I mention, you know, you know, after Cezanne. <laughs> oh, they say, I mean alive. Oh, Richard. <laughs> He's an artist, artist. Uh, let's say he was a maverick. I think that's a better way of putting it. You know, he's a guy who's not resisting anything. He just does it his way. He really is a magician. Eyeball to eyeball. I think he's a kind of master of enigma. I will say he's goddamn oblique. For over four decades, he's been very variously categorized as a pop artist, a minimalist, a conceptualist. Artists knew about him, and collectors knew about him, and dealers knew about him, but in a way, it wasn't a big, you know, like Warhol or Roy Lichtenstein. School of, if you're school of, you're dead. The only chance you have of not drowning is to be original. He, he winds up being in a corner by himself, which is pretty much where I expect he wants to be. I don't know whether you can put him into a category. What would you say? That's fine. Oi, no. I just was hoping you would put one on the ceiling. Oh, but on the ceiling. On, not uh, close to, yeah. but on. I stay off the walls, all right? <laughs> you can't have the floor or the walls. Well, you got the floor and the I'll walls. I'll take the ceiling. The sculptures, too. <laughs> well, right now my heart belongs to these. To the flip. <laughs> A blip is like an Easter egg, the kind that has to be hunted for, but found. It will control the wall, very much the way a dot on a piece of typing paper. Well, that's good, and right in there is perfect. Well, it looks very good. And when you get close to them, it's a bit like looking into the void. You don't know what you're looking at. You could be looking at right into space, into the black hole. Blips were born in California in the winter of uh, 67, 68. And then I uh, started putting some up and then I just kept pulling them down until at one point uh, I had just one. And that was the uh, moment of truth. And then I got one up on the ceiling and then out the door, and then on the billboard, made a hundred of these things. And Detroit, I put the last one up in Detroit. And just as a, uh, like Johnny Appleseed. He kind of enlisted uh, me and a number of friends uh, to go out at night and uh, spray these blips around the city. Uh, we would go up to a movie place on Madison Avenue and put one down there like that and get back in our car. And I think we did one in one of the walkway as over the East River reaching down and so on. We put them all over. Graffiti came out at the same time, which was uh, defacing. And of course, this is defacing also, but it's, this is sort of middle class defacing, you know. So. When you see this one, it reappears in the same spot where it disappeared, kind of. Okay. I have somebody else to, to watch to make sure that nobody's watching and uh, making a fuss, and then off you go. I, I put a bunch of them around in Kansas City, Missouri, and even on the museum's two uh, uh, pillars, <laughs> which I don't think they appreciated that. 
The story I like, though, is the director, he might have been the assistant director of the museum, had a beautiful Monet over his fireplace and at a drinks party or a dinner party or something, Richard and I think John Torriano took the painting down. We were able to take the Monet off of the wall and spray one on the wall and then hang the Monet back up. So you can imagine as the owner, that's a little bit on the upsetting side. There were uh, reported uh, comments on the radio that some kind of uh, black power mark might have been being made, you know. And did you take photographs? Mm, no. <laughs> it wasn't about that. Documentation, no, 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 no. It's a, it's a trip's a trip, and this was a, an impeccable trip. I revel in the drawing because I've been at home with this kind of paper and this kind of drawing instrument, which is charcoal. Uh, it's, it's what I started with. It can be looked at for more than five seconds. That's, uh, and, and I think the object of Artist's object in making a picture is see how long you can get somebody to look at something. Ich habe nachgesucht, was da ist, was nebenan ist, was unter Fuß ist. I look, I look for that which is underfoot. He decided to simply depict or draw everything in a given room in his house, the main elements. And that became an endlessly generative series. Door, window, table, basket, mirror, rug. in Vienna, the gal who was sitting next to me, whom I later married was my first wife, who's no longer with us, uh, she said, shut up and listen. And then since then I've adapted that to shut up and look, but meant politely. What it really means is, I don't know what to say. That's silly. If I kept doing that for a long time, it wouldn't bother you so much. Uh, who said the longer you look at something, any, anything, the longer you look at it, the more interesting it gets. Paraphrase, the longer you do something, the more interesting it gets? I don't know. Because his father was German and his mother was Russian, um, he could speak German. Because he was brought up in New Mexico, he could speak Spanish. He was... Uh, you know, brought up with a kind of European approach towards education, uh, so therefore he knew a lot about philosophy. And I think all of these interesting contrasts, you know, uh, New Mexico in the 40s, can you imagine what it was like, you know, in Las Cruces? It was really a small town. It's like 
January, it's 85 during the day, 35 at night. You go out to your car, it's still there. <laughs> you go to the bank, there's no line. You know, you come out, you still have wheels. You know, nobody's dancing on your car. New York was a little rougher in those days. <laughs> and don't step too far, echoes of my mom's voice going back 70 years. Don't step too far. And a canyon. This is a real canyon. It's just on a small scale. His mother was a painter, so she had Richard looking and studying, and his father was an amateur photographer. So the baseline of a family that was astutely interested in looking at the world um, was one that he grew up in. If you were an inch tall, that would be a real adventure, chugging your way through here. And it would make more sense if that were, let's say, 50, 60 feet down. This way, it's just, it's more of a picture of something that it isn't. His father was a botanist, and his mother did a lot of the illustrations for his father. She was a painter. The, the tendrils do no right from left. They know clockwise and counterclockwise. Going up, it's clockwise. And going up, it's clockwise. Let's keep going on this. We need one more. It's like three witnesses in Islam. That's all you need. And somebody's dead meat. And it is consistent. It's right-handed. This thing is right-handed. Not left-handed, right-handed. Why? You ready? I majored in biology in, in college, and uh, I could go to science, or I could go to art. My girlfriend at the time said, you have the temperament of an artist, uh, you don't have the temperament of a scientist. That wasn't quite true that I don't have the temperament of a scientist, but but I immediately said, okay. That's, uh, and then that night, you know, I made a decision. It's like falling off a cliff, and I didn't sleep well that night. I said, what the hell have I got myself into? Uh, Richard always believed in having a job other than selling art. He's he always has believed in a cottage industry. Richard worked as a baby photographer for a diaper service. And so um, he was photographing thousands of, of infants on a regular basis. You know, that's a great truism with artists. You never have a baby come to your opening because everyone's gonna look at the baby, right? Richard wittily realized that if he painted a baby, people would look at his painting. And he was instrumental in, in establishing workbench, making um, custom-made furniture. People don't believe me. I actually have probably the only one existing actual functioning couch made by Richard Arschwag. <laughs> if I flipped it over, it's signed by Richard. He built me that couch when I moved to New York. Watch me get a hernia. He says, power to the people. See that? Manufactured April Fool's Day, 1971, and, and this is Arschwager signed and Arya Gallus. <laughs> this was how he survived. A studio fire, a disastrous um, workshop fire, 
um, Richard always says that it was disastrous for his business but very positive for his art because it was at that point that he stopped making furniture and turned his work to art. began making works that that smack of function, although though they are without function. Okay. Uh, mirror, mirror, table, table. I'm sitting on a part of this piece of art the table part of it which would throw its tableness into question my favorite in a way is that little early one from about 66 that's made out of formica that looks like a walker but of course it's set up to hit you right in the shin bone so it wouldn't function at all which is works kind of hysterical to take a chair and fling it against the corner of a room and have it stick that piece for the Whitney called the, the organ of cause and effect. <laughs> uh, that's from that happy period. Well, it's just, it's made out for mica. It's really cheesy for mica. And it, you're looking at a, a wall-mounted organ with pipes, and it's quite funny. And to have it called the organ of cause and effect made me laugh. And each chair in this edition is slightly different because, of course, each hide has a different aspect to it. All of the other elements remain the same, but what's interesting too is that it has a humorous twist to it because they're sort of like two kissing cheeks. In theory, I mean, they're horrible. Even that one that he made, the double love seat with that pony skin, it just doesn't really work unless there are two of you and you're both kind of fat. It was just... It was just, a, the, the model for it was just a set of blocks, you know, for children that my oldest daughter used. Yeah. She came up with this. I, I really didn't want to hurt. And with I, very little change, very little change, just scaled it up. Tell me about your American Academy of Arts and Letters. Uh, what got me in was Formica. I just know that. <laughs> Formica, okay. <laughs> I would think that would be the thing that would keep him out of it. At the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, uh, 69, there was some, a show called Art by Telephone, in which Richard called me up and said, steal a rug from Victor Cord. So this is Victor Cord, uh, <coughs> Richard, wearing his famous Luftwaffe leather coat. And of course, that's me with my cape. <laughs> What's really funny is the way, I could be able, the way I was able to get into Victor's house is because Victor's ex-wife was with Richard at that point, and she had the keys to his place, so she mailed me the key. I think when uh, Richard started to show with Mary Boone, when Mary Boone had the big uh, space on West Broadway across from the old Castelli building, that, that began to make Richard's work much more part of the art world. It was the show of our sculptures that were actually art crates that were intentionally made to be art. It was amazing. You went in, and at first you thought, is the show up? <laughs> and then you knew it was him. You know what I mean? Richard often has seemed to me like a walking off-Broadway show. Um, he's like a living Samuel Beckett. And then 
From there, your mind can wander to Magellan going around the world in this thing that was about, well, maybe three times as big as this little room that we're in, not much bigger than that. And they had, uh, to use an express, sexist expression, they had balls. Cojones. In Spanish. And, uh, in German. They don't seem to have a word for that. And nothing comes to mind right away. Uh, I'll have to think about that, but uh, I'll let you know next week. If I'm around. Anybody who could do a lecture on his own work and start with the Lascaux Caves and work his way up to the 20th century has got to be applauded. Just like that. And that's uh, thinking and pausing. Uh, Lucy, everybody knows about Lucy, or no? You don't know about Lucy? Uh, it was the old Divai Gorge, and these people, or the proto people, they were about three, three feet tall. And uh, they're on their way to somewhere. They're walking up the old Divai Gorge, and I get this. They're walking up the old Divai Gorge, and this is, I'm Lucy. Now all we have is those footprints. And the footprints are there, preserved over thousands of years somehow, and they go like this, and then they actually do this. And I don't know who named the owner of those footprints, Lucy, but uh, she would get a kick out of it if she knew. One of the things I always appreciated about Richard is uh, the, his, the way his mind would work. And I have described it to people as similar to the way the, the knight moves on the chess board. All the other movements of all the other uh, pieces on the chess board are linear. Whereas the knight goes two up and two over, right? That's how his mind works. So you'll, you'll be talking about this and he'll jump over there and it'll be the perfect thing in the conversation, you know, and uh, I, I've, uh, I, I see that quality in his uh, mind also manifest in his work. I had a black spot painted on the ceiling and I was stoned and I saw the black spot as three dimensional. So then I made it like a knock worse, you know, a, a three dimensional thing. That was the only time I had any practical, you know, art input from weed that I'm that I'm aware of. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about, uh, well, maybe your schooling or training as, as an artist. Uh... School of Hard Knocks. I wasn't in Chicago then, but I got a phone call from a friend. I said, you better sit down, I got some news for you. There was an earlier painting of a rug, which uh, got lost in a fire in a show in Chicago. And I always wanted to do another, another rug, and so I did. I lost a whole bunch of stuff, yeah. The whole show. The whole show? Yeah. When was that? <clears throat> About 20 years ago, or 20 or 30 years ago. See if something lights a fire, 
maybe then from that, you'll end up actually putting something on a wall somewhere. And then it would be like, take the next step, whatever that would lead to. Uh, and you have to start with something and you could just be blindfolded or just just do something like that or you could just do that and uh, just doing that is one of the starting points that I, I use. To the cold, empty period. I thought he was so interesting a man because he kept moving on to different things. He, it, they would all be about, the per, about perception, but they would be differently executed. And so I was always curious to see what his next show would be about and what he was trying to do. I've been inclined to try out different things and, and uh, and Lord knows I've done that. And uh, period paragraph. It's a fiber board that has a very rough surface so that the paint would drag and skip. And early on, that Celotex was, was manufactured as kind of ceiling acoustic panel. The first one was a uh, cityscape, mm -hmm. and I developed this from an image that was in one of the newspapers in an advertisement of about this size, mm -hmm. and I blew that up to, uh, I think, a four by eight. And in the transition, mm -hmm. it, it threw into question the whole appetite of what is pretty or what is orderly. His idea of the heroic was to take something like a newspaper image and make it bigger. So that, in effect, the Celotex was a, a way of expanding paper to make it seem like it got bigger. <laughs> I always thought that was really funny. He already had a deep connection in my mind, and his too, I think, to Seurat, who really employed the tooth of the paper in his drawings. So to take that to an extreme position, which Richard would, of course, want to do, at least in an experimental way, Celotex offered, you know, Seurat times 10,000. I learned about art by studying the School of Paris and mm -hmm. starting with understanding uh, no, Van Gogh, of course, the, the Impressionist great painting. Mm -hmm. How did it come about that you can see brush strokes for one thing? He animates the surface. He really does a thing with black and white. He gets the movement there so much, and that's where I see this Van Gogh parallel that I'm sure nobody else probably sees, but of movement within the surface of, of the painting in black and white. The sailor one is sculpture rather than really just a painting, it's almost like a window. It was the graduating class of a training camp in somewhere in upstate New York. These were people who were, came from simple surroundings. They knew that they had a good chance of getting killed, but there's an attitude that goes with it. Part of it was Kameradschaft, camaraderie, and some of it was this, uh, looking into an uncertain future. Um, maybe that one that I was working on before, that was turning into, well, let's see where it goes. He did 
did a whole series of works about being, you know, across the table from the person you live with um, day in and day out about the confrontation of daily meals and the intimate uh, life. Men and women are sitting at the table, there, there's something very Beckett-like about them. There's a sense of waiting, but it seems to be waiting for nothing. You know, just this sense of sort of suspended time, of an impasse, of the inability to communicate. There's nothing animated or reassuring about these domestic scenes. There's, it, it has a feeling of being trapped in a kind of architecture. faces that have just somehow devolved into a kind of pulp. Well, his work is not exactly uh, attractive. I mean, it's very nihilistic on all those grey paintings, you know, sort of depressing. I can't say I like it. I know that it's important you don't have to like something that you think is important. Since I am myself not an artist, it takes me a while to adjust. When the first time I see it, I feel, oh my God, you've changed the game, and I don't like your new rhythm particularly, or, you know, this is a new dance step that I can't follow, and you shouldn't be doing it either. And then a little bit of time elapses, and it all looks like it should, and I think eventually we catch up. I actually think the work in many cases um, isn't likable. It wasn't intended to be likable. It was intended to be experienced. And that, um, I think, what's interesting to me is that the early work now looks very beautiful in a way that I'm not sure Richard intended it to be. It's a very pregnant picture. Something is going to happen. Somebody's going to come at the door, or, or, which actually makes it very unstable. It was a, really, a, I don't remember where I got that, but a beautiful image, and it was uh, serene. It was like, uh, it was really like a communion. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, the so host. The host being given to the dog. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Sort of a St. Francis of Assisi. Well, <laughs> but, um, no, she's not oh, a Saint Saint Francis. She's not no, St. No, no, Francis, no. no. This painting has pretty much become one of the, the poster painting of the show, of the poster girls. I guess. And well, it's, it's such a wonderful image. And uh, it's called Three Women, but it's really one woman in three poses, three dresses. Or the cinematic, you know. The cinematic. As, as happens on the, mm -hmm. on the runway or, or whatever. It's, women do this nice thing. And <laughs> I love the way women move. Yeah. Richard went to um, University of Wisconsin as a visiting artist and fell madly in love with Kathy Cord and brought her back to New York. And so therefore, he had to have a divorce. And part of the settlement was a certain amount of money. And he was going to make the money by additioning this piece and uh, he needed to do it fast, so he enlisted a number of friends, myself included. And it's made out of solid uh, white oak. Uh, the sides are, and the files are, and then the top has, is, is imitation white oak for mica. Uh, it's a great piece, you know, uh, and it, it reflects a lot of uh, what Richard was about at the time. If, if you pull the first drawer, you get the outside illusion of white oak inside. Then the next drawer, 
bottomless. So you look right down to the floor. The third one has a piece of glass in it, which makes it into a window. Then you have the mirror, which serves as a narcissus experience. And then you have blah, the signature. <laughs> The material is something I stepped on once. There was a piece of it, uh, you know, on the, on the sidewalk, and I looked at that, and I was inspired by what goes on there, which is, uh, I'm very given to drawing, but I, but I saw that's a lot of lines. That stuff, which is truly repulsive, because it looks like very thick pubic hair, sort of is a symbol for all of the you know, dust bunnies of the world. I mean, I look at some of that rubberized hair because I have a couple of them in the hallway of my house. And they're, you know, moderately repulsive, which I think is what he's seeking. And why do you have them in the hallway of your house? Because I like being moderately repulsed. <laughs> Set up your son? Uh, originally, yeah. This was just from uh, recollection. It's the kind of climbing that an eight year old, seven year old, or even six year old will do for any kid. Uh, and when they really begin to have the mobility, and, uh, and then the world gets interesting in a way because you got access. Times here. Described in the third, I featured in the third man, realized. The third man, hated by a thousand men, desired by one woman. Joseph Cotton in his most successful performance as an American caught in a whirlpool of continental intrigue. What's that? of your old stomping grass. Yeah. Yeah. Wendy's okay, and then there's another one. It was uh, liberation, occupation, which was then wartime, starvation time, and, and not a whole lot of food. As it happens with cities, the cities suffer the most. And I did go hunting somewhere out here in the, in the suburbs. I uh, saw a couple of pheasant, and I, I snuck out with my over and under 20 gauge shotgun and flushed them the, the two pheasant. And I got one with one barrel, and I got the other one with the other barrel, which was uh, not supposed to happen, but <laughs> uh, I was quite thrilled and packed them up and, and uh, headed to Vienna. Went to the Bristol Hotel and uh, went to the kitchen and you know whoever was in charge there and I said, look, I got these, uh, I got these two birds. Uh, I'll give you one of them and you do the other one up for me and you do it nice. So I, I have this reach into uh, earlier times and. One of the nifty things about being my age is that you have a personal recollection, you have a sense of history that you can taste, because you've been there. My job during the war is to get tactical information, which I did from prisoners of war, but mainly civilians, including children, 
And uh, as I've said before, none of this under duress. There was just a conversation, whatever. And wanted to tell me. And the only time I I can remember breaking that rule was uh, I had been uh, questioning this soldier, and I I needed to trip him up, and I said to him, you know, you're gay. He said, no, wrong. And then he t proceeded to tell me all these things that were proof that he could possibly be gay, you know, all these soldierly things that he had uh, that he had done where he had been. So, so you know, people like to talk. Now this is the package right. Just the uh -oh, yeah, he should. Forty-three. So next one. Hmm. Where the bus stop is. <laughs> 41. Does it look at all familiar? I'll try them again. Uh, actually, uh... Whoop, yeah, the light, the light went, went on. off. Does that mean that he's clicking the door? And yeah, I'm not I think this is another one of those light switches, yeah. Just goes on when somebody comes walking by. This is all commercial. Nobody is around, but it's the house. I remember the floor. I feel like I'm a ghost. <laughs> the floor, definitely, yes. This is definitely it. And I would have been upstairs. Oh, I'm very uh, uh, Entschuldige, dass ich störe, aber ich war im Zweiten Weltkrieg, Ende des Zweiten Weltkriegs, war ich hier ein Quartier und ich habe mich nicht. Jedenfalls bin so nah und war hier auf. Uh, uh, hier my, mein Deutsch ist sehr schlecht. Oh, um, what's your preferred English, language? English. Oh, great. <laughs> okay, the last time I was here was as an American soldier. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, <laughs> and we had uh, occupied this house, and I was quartered in this house. I, had, I do remember the floor, most definitely. And the dining room, I think, was downstairs. The kitchen and dining room, um. is that correct? Well, you know, this has all been all changed, changed into around. apartments, so, yeah, you know, there is... of course. So it's, but we all have, floor, I'm sure that that's... It looks, I understand this was uh, 50 years ago that I was... I think he saw, you know, power, chaos, destruction, counter power, counter chaos, and counter destruction, so... Having been in the Battle of the Bulge must have been a bit of an eye-opener, and then being later in counterintelligence after the war, or at the very end of the war, must have been an eye-opener as well. My knowledge of Richard was that he was an artillery spotter, that he would sneak into a German town at, at night, and then he would climb into a church Tower. And I guess because he spoke fluent German, that he would, if somebody stopped him on the street, I can only assume that he spoke German well enough to perhaps talk his way out of it. And down here you have two hearts. Those are the uh, two hearts and three quarter time. <laughs> and there's a I think probably Strauss or one of these. Somebody after Strauss wrote da 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 da
<laughs> Richard and John Torriano are rivaling for the number of wives they've had. And this is again sort of the way Richard is. I think in the art world where a lifestyle it can include intensive promiscuity, I mean, I think that they've probably had no more or less relationships than a lot of other people. They've just gotten married. <laughs> Maybe Richard likes to get married a lot. He looks good in a suit. And he's a hell of a dancer. There's a quality of Fred Astaire to Richard. <laughs> he married uh, Molly and had two children with her, and I married her first. Eventually, she had an affair with him, and they ran off. He left Kathy, they ran off, and then uh, something happened between him and her, and uh, he ended up with Anne. It's a small world. <laughs> All right, so what do we do now? Now, are all the pieces in? Is this possible to stand up or not? No, absolutely, let's stand that thing up. This is even higher. Huh? Yeah, I think it has to be higher. Not necessarily, maybe. Maybe a couple of centimeters. I think it's good. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. 100% sure, huh? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Nah. Nah. Yeah. 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 It looks good together. It's not mannerism, it's not seen at an angle. That thing wants to be seen straight on. It wants to be running somewhere. You can see it straight on from here. What if you had the running man and then the skater? Or would that look like... It's a, not, or the skater That's could terrible be here. for the running man. Okay, really or the is. skater could be here. The running man stays where it is. Right here, too. Right into the shadow. That's... That's... Just another one centimeter at this point. Two no, centimeters. don't put it in the shadow. No? I think that's perfect. This is good. Yeah, it's funny that the hair works a little bit of a, a distance and then it, it jumps right off the wall. Seit April hat die Galerie Kargel einen zusätzlichen Raum. Die Box. Verantwortlich für die Gestaltung war der Allstar der amerikanischen Kunstszene, Richard Archwager. Jetzt bekam der Künstler Gelegenheit, im selbst entworfenen Raum seine neue Werkgruppe zu präsentieren. That's something that I thought would would fit in nicely with whatever was adjacent. And I thought the jump in color would not be disruptive, but but would fit with what's there. And this trial and error and looking at this marbleized and what goes good with that. And I think I think I hit the, it just right. Looks like it's a work of a 35-year-old artist, isn't it? Totally fresh. He's 88 years old, and that is a challenge every day. Well, I just love the colors. I, he, he is just so much of a, a weird colorist. I mean, he, he's, the colors are really off, and yet they, they work beautifully.
what makes Archwater's work so absolutely avant-garde is the fact that they're just always so ahead of the curve. I mean, I just think that people cannot grasp the work um, initially. There's something very strange and exotic about each painting and each sculpture um, when it's seen for the first time. There's something in that one over there that's abstract. What is that one? It's really, they're stupendous. The, the colors are, they're wild, aren't they? are wild. It's so it's such a shock, actually, to see this much color. Absolutely. I haven't seen you use color like this in a long, long, long time. I am blown away by the color. Isn't it You're fabulous? using color. I'm so excited. It's fun. It's so fab. Isn't that wonderful? Well, After all those years of black and white. Anyone who's older than me who's turning out this kind of work, I want to see. Richard, what's going on in the window? Well, that's another encounter. This is an encounter. It knows to be the same two, the same people, or it could be seen, thought of that way. But they're, uh, are they outside the window, or is that, in the, or are they watching, is he watching a, a movie that had been done of, of him and her, or? Where do you paint? Uh, upstate New York, uh, Hudson, New York, which is up in the boondocks and, where are you from? Where do you live? God, where do you live? Well, I live uh, right now. I'd like to live right here. <laughs> and uh, I don't, I don't really relish the idea of going back. Look, at, can you believe that? Oh, you're wearing a wire, are you? This is this has been foisted on me. I always me. thought you worked for the CIA. I've watched him change as we both have gotten older. He is willing to look around and into himself, and he's willing to accommodate change, which is probably the biggest charge in life. Now, just recently, which I think is really fascinating, he's been primarily making drawings, drawings that are rooted in his imagination. He actually has gone back to the New Mexican landscape. I think I have to get bigger. 12 feet, 16 feet. I mean, that's the wall back there. And what I've done is to put a Hammond organ there. And as you see, I'm not playing it. And I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to move it because it's, 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 it's wrecking the wall. And probably the clock will have to go too. So, in other words, I need to get serious. And I better do that. I have, I think I have lots of time ahead of me, but it's not unlimited. And I better get into some big ones. Period, paragraph. <laughs>